At the height of his success, Burt Reynolds was one of the most popular movie stars in the world, but this all came crashing down for the actor around the time of his divorce from television actress Lonnie Anderson. The divorce came at a low point in Burt's career, and he subsequently had to file for bankruptcy. Allegations of abuse have tainted the actor's legacy, though he was able to put aside his differences with Lonnie before his 2018 death after achieving a career renaissance in the late 90s. Although Burt and Lonnie set aside their differences, she remains open about her dissatisfaction with their marriage. Join Facts First as Lonnie Anderson confesses secrets behind Burt Reynolds' divorce. When Burt Reynolds was in college, he had aspirations of becoming a professional football player. It appeared he might have the skills, but he ended up suffering a number of tragic injuries that prevented him from pursuing his dreams. Instead, Burt turned to acting in his college drama department. Eventually, he realized he was good enough at it that it might make a promising career. He made a bid for Hollywood stardom, and it proved successful. At the height of his success, he was one of the most popular stars in the world. He used this clout to date a variety of Hollywood starlets, though he was only married two times over the course of his life. Burt's first spouse had been a woman named Judy Carn, who he married in 1963 and divorced in 65. Burt didn't marry again until over two decades later. He dated around in Hollywood for a number of years, and many thought the star would never find someone worthy of pinning him down. But that all changed when he starred alongside actress Lonnie Anderson in the 1983 film Stroker Ace. Lonnie had gained success for her tenure on the sitcom WKRP in Cincinnati, and her role in Stroker Ace was an attempt to break into film. Though it didn't prove successful, it did prove the start of a relationship that later blossomed into marriage. Lonnie had been on WKRP for five years as the radio station's lovable secretary. Audiences and critics alike adored her, and she was nominated for three Golden Globe Awards. Lonnie's success on the series garnered her the role alongside Burt Reynolds in Stroker Ace, and it's not hard to see how the actress made an impression on him. Stroker Ace followed the exploits of its titular character, a NASCAR driver played by Reynolds. Lonnie Anderson played his love interest. Though the film isn't too widely remembered, the resulting relationship between Burt and Lonnie certainly made an impact on the tabloids. The two dated for a number of years before tying the knot in 1988. Their wedding was incredibly elaborate, and attendees had to be flown in by helicopter. It took place in Florida and was given its own article in People magazine. It seemed to the public Bert and Lonnie were living the dream, but this dream soon turned to a nightmare. Soon into their marriage, Bert and Lonnie decided to adopt a son. While the adopted child was meant to bring the pair together, other things were tearing them apart. One of the biggest concerns Bert had with Lonnie seems to have been her exuberant spending habits. Bert had reportedly given his spouse a credit card with a spending limit of nearly $50,000, which Lonnie spent in less than an hour. There were also numerous rumors of infidelity on the part of both spouses, something that didn't come as much of a surprise to the public given their romantic histories. The tabloids documented all these troubles, and the public enjoyed watching the former power couple become fodder for increasingly dramatic gossip. Into the 1990s, it was clear the marriage between Bert and Lonnie wasn't going to last. They divorced in 1994, after which point Bert could be seen and heard all over the media spouting vitriol about his former spouse. Lonnie refused to retaliate, saying she didn't want to stoop to her former husband's level. But she eventually came forward with some shocking stories of abuse she claimed to have suffered at Bert's hands. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. And stick around for more about Bert and Lonnie. By the time Bert and Lonnie were divorcing in 1994, neither star was anywhere near the celebrity they'd once been. Their relationship was arguably their only remaining source of fame, as the vicious rumors Bert began spreading about his former wife became the only thing the public was interested in hearing from either party. Bert ended up filing for bankruptcy after the divorce, so it's not hard to see why he saw fit to continually bring up the fact that his marriage to Lonnie had cost him so much money. He derided her for being overly materialistic, claiming she couldn't be be seen wearing the same outfit more than once. Lonnie refused to retaliate at first to Bert's attacks in the media before eventually changing her mind. Although Lonnie had made a pact with herself not to stoop to her husband's level, she eventually decided she had no choice. When she finally started bringing to light her own side of the story, the tales she had to tell proved much more damning than Bert's tales of a materialistic wife. According to Lonnie, Bert was physically abusive to her numerous times during their marriage, with him constantly telling her no one would believe her over him due to the fact that he was more famous. 
Bert claimed the marriage fell apart because Lonnie had refused to be intimate with him for three years. He also shared a tale that his mother had told him that marrying Lonnie was a bad idea during the marriage ceremony. But if Lonnie's stories are true, Bert deserved the damage to his reputation and career that came alongside his divorce. While Bert had sunk to rock bottom in the years after his divorce from Lonnie, he ended up being given a second chance when he was cast in the 1997 film Boogie Nights. The public had a hard time reconciling Bert's rejuvenated stardom with Lonnie's allegations. However, it appears that both the public and Lonnie herself agreed to forgive Bert by the time of his 2018 death. The two were reported to have made up to the point they were able to sit down and have dinner together in the years before he died. Lonnie always maintained Bert had been physically abusive towards her, but she also always maintained Bert had always been a loving father. Princess Diana was competing for tabloid fodder for Burt Reynolds and Lonnie Anderson around the time of their divorce, with the couple winning out much of the headline space during the most heated moments. Because of this, Princess Di was said to have sent Burt Reynolds a card thanking him for keeping her name out of the tabloids for the time being. Burt owed money to Lonnie from the divorce until just a year before his death. He had a hard time keeping up with the hefty payments due to his sporadic work later on in life, but was eventually able to give her everything the court said he owed her. Reynolds died of a heart attack at age 82. While Burt and Lonnie may have found peace before the end of his life, Burt always claimed the two were never meant to be together. According to Burt, the only true love of his life was actress Sally Fields. They met on Smokey and the Bandit and developed a romantic relationship, but it eventually fell apart due to Burt's substance abuse. This substance abuse also continued throughout his marriage to Lonnie, playing a part in his poor behavior. Soon after his death, Sally Fields published a memoir called In Pieces. According to Sally, she was glad that Burt was dead by the time of the memoir's publishing due to the things it said about him. Goldie and Gus Hans' first marriage was to Gus Triconis. The pair had a romantic relationship in the late 60s and early 70s. Gus, born November 18, 1937 in New York, was a Greek-American actor, director, and choreographer. He had a notable career in Hollywood, particularly as a choreographer and director for various TV shows and films. Goldie and Gus met in the late 60s when Goldie was still a rising star in Hollywood. They began dating and soon became a high-profile couple in the entertainment industry. Their relationship was marked by their shared passion for dance and entertainment. Goldie and Gus got married May 16, 1969. The wedding took place in Honolulu. Sadly, they separated April 9, 1973. After the relationship came to an end, both of them moved on to other pursuits. Goldie continued her successful acting career, earning an Academy Award for her role in Cactus Flower and becoming a prominent figure in the world of comedy and film. Gus Triconis continued his career as a choreographer and director. Goldie and Bill Goldie Hawn and Bill Hudson, a musician and actor, met in the early 70s. The two were both on a flight together and struck up a conversation shortly before landing. Bill was a member of the popular musical group The Hudson Brothers, known for their music and appearances on television shows. Goldie and Bill's relationship progressed quickly, and they became engaged in 1975. They exchanged their vows in a private and intimate ceremony July 3, 1976, in Tacoma Park, Maryland, at Bill Hudson's family home. It was attended by close friends and family members making it a relatively low-key affair despite Goldie's rising fame in Hollywood. Goldie, known for her free-spirited and easy-going nature, opted for a less traditional wedding approach, which was aligned with her personality. Their Ups and Downs Goldie and Bill's relationship was marked by both joyous moments and challenges. They welcomed their first child, a son named Oliver Hudson, on September 7, 1976. Their second child, Kate Hudson, was born April 19, 1979. These moments of becoming parents were undoubtedly joyous occasions for the couple. As a Hollywood pair, Goldie and Bill were often seen at public events together, and they appeared to be a happy and loving family. They were known for their relaxed and carefree approach to life, which endeared them to many fans. Over time, Goldie and Bill's career priorities began to diverge. Goldie's career in Hollywood continued to flourish, while Bill's career as a musician faced challenges. This shift in their professional lives may have added strain to the relationship. After their divorce in 1982, Goldie Hawn and Bill Hudson remained committed to co-parenting their two children, Kate and Oliver. Despite the end of the relationship, 
They prioritized their roles as parents and maintained a functional co-parenting arrangement. This included attending school events, birthdays, and other important milestones in their children's upbringing. Their dedication to providing a stable and loving environment for Kate and Oliver was evident. Kate and Oliver often express gratitude for the love and support they received from both sides of the family. The Different Takes on the Divorce Over the years, Goldie and Bill have talked about the details of the relationship and their divorce, but their takes are quite different, which perhaps shouldn't come as a huge surprise. Goldie, for her part, talked about the relationship a lot over the years, often in interviews. She portrayed it as a situation that went south in large part because he was jealous of her success. This was a trait she claims Bill shared with Gus. She was quoted as saying, The basic problem was that the two men I fell in love with and married just could not cope with the pressure of having a wife who was more successful than they were. However, Bill, after years of silence on the topic, released a memoir called Two Versions, The Other Side of Fame and Family. In his book, Bill Hudson shares his perspective on their relationship and the events leading to their divorce, which differs from the narrative often presented by Goldie Hawn. One notable aspect of Hudson's account is his assertion that Goldie had expressed a desire for an open marriage after they got married. According to his claim, Goldie conveyed this idea to him, suggesting they should have the freedom to explore other romantic relationships outside of the marriage. This was a significant point of contention in the relationship. In two versions, Bill also suggests that Goldie has misrepresented the story of the divorce. He shares his perspective on the challenges and issues that led to the end of the marriage. He also claims Goldie has portrayed the situation inaccurately to her family. In an interview about the book, Bill takes issue with Goldie's constant references to him not living up to his role as a husband and father. Said Bill, for years, I have been living with the hell of Goldie manipulating the story of our time together. He added that she presents a story to the world that he had abandoned the family and that her longtime partner, Kurt Russell, has been the only real man in the situation. It's, of course, worth noting divorces are often complex and involve multiple viewpoints, and it's not uncommon for each party to have their own version of events. For decades now, Goldie has been with actor Kurt Russell. Although the two met for the first time on the set of the Disney musical film The One and Only Genuine Original Family Band in 68, they didn't start dating at the time. Goldie was married to Bill Hudson then, and Kurt Russell was a young actor trying to establish himself in the industry. But their initial meeting planted the seeds for a friendship that eventually led to romance. Goldie and Kurt reconnected on the set of the World War II-era film Swing Shift in 1983. At this point, they were both single, having gone through divorces. Their on-screen chemistry was undeniable, and they developed a strong bond off-screen as well. While filming Swing Shift, they began to date. Their romantic relationship blossomed naturally and organically, and they soon became one of Hollywood's most beloved couples. Despite their long-lasting and committed relationship, Goldie and Kurt made the choice not to get married. They've been together for decades without formalizing the relationship through marriage, a decision they've explained as a reflection of their commitment to each other rather than a lack of commitment. Another aspect of their relationship is the blending of their families. Goldie has two children from her previous marriage, Kate and Oliver Hudson, while Kurt Russell had a son, Boston Russell, from his previous marriage. And then they had a son, Wyatt, together in 1986. Together, they raised these children and became a close-knit and loving blended family. Over the years, Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell have appeared in several films together, including Overboard in 1987 and The Christmas Chronicles in 2018, which have only further solidified their status as one of Hollywood's most iconic and enduring couples. Their relationship is often cited as a testament to the power of love, trust, and mutual respect in maintaining a successful partnership in the entertainment industry. McQueen turned McGraw's life and career upside down. Born to commercial artist parents in Bedford Village, New York, McGraw grew up with a lack of self-esteem and was surrounded by drama. Her parents were constantly at odds with each other, and her father was a morbid alcoholic whose temper flared when he hit the bottle. To get away from her home life, she started modeling, landing a pretty decent gig under Diana Vreeland. 
A couple years later, she scored her first role in the film A Lovely Way to Die. Her next significant bit of screen time was in the hit 1969 rom-com Goodbye Columbus. While she was modeling in college, Allie met director Robert Evans, who eventually cast her in Love Story as Jenny. One day, McGraw visited Evans' Beverly Hills home to go over the role and ended up never leaving. The two struck up a romance and got married not long after. McGraw's career suddenly exploded. The positive critical reception her previous performances had garnered, coupled with her marriage to one of Tinseltown's most revered directors, resulted in her being one of the most sought-after actresses of her day. In 1971, McQueen came to her home to inquire if she wanted to work with him on The Getaway. But from the moment she opened the door, Allie was absolutely smitten by the handsome man standing in front of her. They shared an instant connection that led to them starting an affair. Not long after, McGraw left Evans and moved in with McQueen. And for a spell, their life was filled with romance and happiness that they'd never known before. Before we tell you more, be sure to give this video a like and subscribe to Factsverse if you haven't already. Allie describes their relationship as chemical. In 2018, the 83-year-old actress sat down with People magazine and discussed her marriage to Steve McQueen. When describing what kind of relationship they had, Allie referred to it as chemical. McGraw said Steve could walk into a room and any man, woman, or child would go, whoa, what was that? She went on to say she was no exception. While Allie found McQueen incredibly attractive most of the time, she said there was always an element of danger with him, adding there was, as she put it, a bad boy there. In 2017, McGraw gave another interview to the UK's Times news outlet. She described how their marriage started blissful but quickly spiraled into chaos. The two lived together in a secluded Malibu home where they spent most of their time, quote, half naked on the beach while enjoying frequent barbecues and a never-ending supply of beer and cannabis. Jack Lemon and Walter Matthau were their neighbors, but they mainly mingled with the more common folk. McGraw told the Times she's grateful they lived there before the advent of the modern smartphone and the invasion of privacy that comes with celebrities having their pictures taken when they step out of their homes. While they still had to put up with the paparazzi, they at least knew where they were going to be. McQueen's dark side reared its ugly head. While Allie had described McQueen as being a principled and original person, when they first got together, she didn't know he was battling his own inner demons related to childhood traumas. His dad had abandoned his family when he was a baby, and his mom sent him to boarding school for troubled children when he was 14. Since then, he never trusted women. McGraw, unfortunately, had to learn this the hard way. Her first red flag was when he made her sign a prenup, but at the time, she was too infatuated to suspect anything about him might have been worrisome. He wanted her to quit working. Another red flag was McQueen's pre-matrimonial demand that she quit working. Instead of fighting this request and sticking with her lucrative and successful acting career, she simply submitted and stayed at home to raise their two sons. Pretty soon, McGraw started feeling stifled. Steve would regularly explode with anger if he saw her so much as look at another man. Not one to talk, his eyes would often wander. Not surprisingly, their relationship quickly soured, and in 1977, they separated and divorced a year later. In 1980, when McQueen died of cancer, McGraw was understandably devastated. Their marriage might not have been the best, but she still loved him. Throughout their time together, she always feared he would someday leave her, but she never expected him to leave the world so soon. McGraw fell into a deep, dark depression. To numb her pain, she sought solace in alcohol. She soon found herself at the Betty Ford Clinic, where she admitted to not only being an alcoholic, but also identified as male. It's unclear whether or not she still identifies as a man, as she still uses female pronouns. But the fact that she was able to come to terms with her alcoholism was an enormous step in the right direction. She underwent extensive therapy to curb her addiction, and in 1994, she left Hollywood behind to live a quiet life in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Since then, she's penned an autobiography called Moving Pictures that has earned her the title of best-selling author. McGraw admits that for the longest time, she continued to live in the past, always pondering what might have been if things had played out differently. But now, she's more focused than she has ever been on her future. In addition to writing, McGraw also likes to paint, garden, and occasionally go out on a date or two. She also devotes a lot of time and energy to animal welfare causes and actively practices a daily meditation and yoga routine. She's not that interested in acting anymore, but in 2016, she briefly reunited with her former Love Story co-star Ryan O'Neill for a touring production of the play Love Letters. The two aging stars have maintained a close relationship over the years and still enjoy each other's company immensely. I miss that. Suzanne's career 
Suzanne Plachette had a remarkable career in the entertainment industry, leaving behind a legacy of memorable performances and contributions to film, television, and stage. With her distinctive voice, charisma, and talent, she showcased her versatility as an actress and became a beloved figure in the world of entertainment. One of her career highlights was her role as Emily Hartley, the witty and intelligent wife of Bob Newhart's character in the classic sitcom The Bob Newhart Show. Her portrayal of Emily garnered critical acclaim and earned her multiple Emmy Award nominations, showcasing her comedic timing and ability to bring depth to her characters. She also excelled in dramatic roles. Her performance as Annie Hayworth in Hitchcock's The Birds showcased her acting prowess. In addition to her work on screen, she had a notable stage career. She made her Broadway debut in the 1961 production of The Cold Wind and the Warm and received critical acclaim. She went on to appear in several other theatrical productions, including The Miracle Worker and Butterflies Are Free, further solidifying her reputation as a versatile and talented actress. Plachette lent her voice to various animated projects, including the role of Zira in Disney's The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. Throughout her career, she received numerous accolades, including a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Troy's career Considered one of the heartthrobs of the 60s, Donahue's charm and on-screen presence captivated audiences. His career highlights include his breakthrough role in the film A Summer Place, where he starred alongside Sandra D. The film became a box office hit and established Donahue as a rising star, admired for his good looks and talent. His portrayal of Johnny Hunter, a troubled teenager in a forbidden romance, garnered critical acclaim. He appeared in numerous films throughout the 60s, showcasing his versatility. His notable performances include Parish, Rome Adventure, and Palm Springs Weekend. These roles solidified his status as a teen idol and heartthrob, earning him a dedicated fan base. He also made a successful transition to television, appearing in popular shows like the primetime soap opera Surfside 6, and he had guest appearances on shows like Hawaii Five-0 and The Love Boat. These roles allowed him to reach a broader audience and further cemented his status as a recognizable face in the industry. His career experienced a resurgence in the 90s when he appeared in smaller roles in films like Crybaby and The Boys from Sunset Ridge. Suzanne's Personal Life Suzanne Plachette's personal life was as intriguing as her successful career in the entertainment industry. Born January 31, 1937, in New York City, Plachette was known for her beauty, wit, and spirited personality. After her marriage to Troy, Plachette went on to marry Texas oilman Tom Gallagher in 1968. They remained together until Gallagher's passing in 2000, marking a significant and enduring relationship in Plachette's life. In 2001, Plachette found love again and married actor Tom Poston, best known for his role on Newhart. The couple had been friends for years before the romantic relationship blossomed. Plachette and Poston enjoyed over seven years of marriage until his death in 2007. Despite her relationships, Plachette didn't have any children, but she often expressed her love for animals and was an advocate for animal rights and welfare. She was also known for a vibrant personality and quick wit, both on and off screen. She had a reputation for being charming, intelligent, and direct. Her down-to-earth nature and sense of humor made her a beloved figure in the entertainment industry. Suzanne faced health challenges later in life, which ultimately led to her passing January 19, 2008. In 2006, she was diagnosed with lung cancer, which came as a shock to fans and the industry. She chose to undergo treatment and remained optimistic throughout her battle with the disease. She continued working on various projects, displaying determination and passion. She made guest appearances on TV shows like Will and & Grace and lent her voice to animated films like The Lion King 1 and a Half. Sadly, her health gradually declined and she ultimately succumbed to respiratory failure at her L.A. home on January 19, 2008. She was 70 years old. Troy's Personal Life Troy Donahue, born Merle Johnson on January 27, 1936, had a personal life with ups and downs. Donahue's love life was eventful as he was married and divorced several times. After his marriage to Suzanne, he went on to marry three more times, each one ending in divorce. Donahue had a son, Sean, from his marriage to actress Valerie Allen, but unfortunately their relationship was strained. 
Like many Hollywood stars, Donahue battled personal issues, including struggles with alcoholism and financial difficulties. He faced multiple DUI arrests and had stints in rehab as he tried to overcome his addiction. These challenges impacted his career and his popularity waned as he struggled to regain his earlier success. He also experienced heart problems that required surgery, and he suffered from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, added complications to his already challenging circumstances. In the 60s, he was considered a heartthrob, often cast in romantic leading roles. His handsome looks and on-screen charisma endeared him to audiences. Suzanne and Troy's Failed Marriage Suzanne Plachette and Troy Donahue were two prominent actors, and their relationship and marriage captivated the public's attention. The couple first met in the early 60s while working on the film Rome Adventure. Their on-screen chemistry quickly translated into a real-life romance, leading to their marriage on January 4, 1964. Plachette, known for her roles in films like The Birds and the television series The Bob Newhart Show, and Donahue, best known for his performances in films like A Summer Place, seemed like a glamorous Hollywood couple. They exuded charm and beauty, attracting a great deal of media and public attention, but the relationship faced significant challenges. They divorced in 1964 after just six months, and while the definitive reasons why they ended things so quickly haven't ever been fully revealed, Insiders to their situation have weighed in on their theories. There were rumors that Troy had a continuous affair with actress Connie Stevens during the entire time he was married to Plachette. If true, that would certainly have put a serious strain on the relationship. Then there were persistent rumors that Suzanne was actually into actor Glenn Ford, but many have also pinned the issues with their marriage on the conflicting nature of their tastes and style of living. Reportedly, Suzanne was more interested in a traditional household of wealth. To her, that meant a formal-looking house with a butler serving their every need. She also wanted a level of formality with everyday events like dinner. She wanted the dinners to be elegant with candles and champagne. Troy, on the other hand, was a classic beach bum type. He preferred lounging in an informal setting clad in beachwear and a formal dinner was the last thing on his mind. He was content snagging a burger and fries from a local spot. Then there was the rumor that Suzanne didn't really like Troy's friends, which can always put a strain on a marriage. But despite it all, she remained positive about the experience. She later said, quote, Troy was a sweet, good man. We were just never destined to be married. We didn't have the same values, but I'm not bitter. He taught me how to laugh. Bertinelli's Rise Valerie Bertinelli's journey from a TV sweetheart to a rock and roll icon's wife captivated the hearts of fans worldwide. Before her fateful encounter with Eddie Van Halen, Valerie had already begun to make a name for herself in the entertainment industry. Her early life and career paved the way for the remarkable story. Valerie Bertinelli was born April 23, 1960, in Wilmington, Delaware. She grew up in a close-knit Italian-American family, where she developed an intense love for acting at a young age. In the 70s, her talent and charm caught the attention of casting directors, propelling her towards success. In 1975, at age 15, she made her acting debut in the television drama Apple's Way, but her big breakthrough role in a particularly popular sitcom was still yet to come. While her professional life was finally starting to take shape, her personal life was about to take a dramatic turn. Little did she know that a chance encounter with a rock and roll legend would forever change the course of her life. A Serendipitous Encounter Valerie and Eddie's paths first crossed in the late 70s when Valerie was an up-and-coming actress starring in the hit TV series One Day at a Time. Eddie was on the brink of rock stardom. According to Valerie, fate brought them together at a concert where sparks immediately flew, and a deep connection was quickly forged. This chance meeting ultimately set the stage for a remarkable, albeit heartbreakingly challenging, journey together. Not long after the couple initiated the relationship, they took things to the next level. On a memorable spring day, April 11, 1981, Valerie and Eddie exchanged vows and embarked on a marital voyage that captured the attention of fans and tabloids the world over. Weathering Storms Valerie and Eddie's relationship epitomized the intensity of rock and roll love. They were both extremely driven and passionate individuals devoted to their respective crafts. As Eddie's career soared, their lives became a whirlwind of tours, late-night recording sessions, and the constant glare of the public eye. Their marriage was a delicate dance of balancing their individual aspirations and the need to nurture their connection. 
Like any relationship, they face their fair share of challenges, the pressures of fame, Eddie's struggles with addiction, and the demands of their respective careers took their toll. But they persevered, at least for as long as they could, demonstrating their resilience and commitment to each other time and time again. The Birth of Wolfgang The birth of Valerie and Eddie's son, Wolfgang Van Halen, on March 16, 1991, brought immeasurable joy to Valerie and Eddie's lives. It was a profound milestone that altered their relationship, deepening their connection as they embraced the responsibilities of parenthood. Wolfgang became a binding force, a constant reminder of the love that brought them together. Unfortunately, even the addition of Wolfgang to the Van Halen clan wasn't enough to keep Eddie and Valerie's dysfunctional union afloat forever. The End of an Era Despite their efforts to sustain the marriage, Valerie and Eddie reached a point where the strains were insurmountable. In December of 2005, they decided to separate, and the divorce proceedings began. The proceedings, which spanned over two years, were marked by a blend of legal complexities and emotional turmoil. Although they undoubtedly had a laundry list of complaints to lodge at each other, Valerie and Eddie navigated the division of assets and the custody arrangements for the sake of their beloved son. And while the process was clearly challenging, they managed to maintain a sense of respect and dignity, focusing on the well-being of their family. What happened? As we already pointed out, Valerie Bertinelli and Eddie Van Halen's marriage, while filled with love and passion, faced numerous challenges that ultimately led to its chaotic collapse. One of the most significant factors contributing to their separation was Eddie's battles with addiction. His struggles with drugs and alcohol created strain and tension within their relationship. Valerie, however, stood by his side, empathizing with his pain and providing unwavering support. Another obstacle they encountered was the heartbreaking loss of a pregnancy. This devastating experience tested their emotional elasticity, further straining their connection. Additionally, Eddie's diagnosis of tongue cancer shook their world. Despite their admirable efforts to navigate these hardships, the weight of the difficulties eventually took a toll too large on their relationship. Soulmates It's worth noting that both Valerie and Eddie entered into second marriages while carrying lingering feelings. Valerie's recent divorce from Tom Vitale, finalized in 2022, has sparked speculation about the impact of her enduring love for Eddie. In her most recent memoir, Enough Already, she shared an intimate conversation with Eddie before his death acknowledging their shared regrets and the possibility of unresolved feelings. But she emphasized that their decision not to act on those feelings was a mutual understanding, and there was never really a chance of rekindling the relationship. Her divorce from Vitaly was driven by them growing apart rather than her feelings for Eddie. Despite Tom's attempts to secure spousal support, Valerie successfully argued against it, highlighting their prenuptial agreement. Valerie's enduring affection for Eddie, whom she described as her soulmate, suggests her connection with him remained profound even after their divorce and subsequent marriages. In the end, the reasons behind Valerie and Eddie's marriage ending are multifaceted, involving struggles with addiction, personal challenges, and the complexities of love and compatibility. Their journey together was filled with highs and lows, and while their paths ultimately diverged, their connection and the legacy they created will undoubtedly forever be a part of Valerie's life. Resilience Valerie has remained active and successful in her career. She's become a familiar face on the Food Network, hosting popular cooking shows like Valerie's Home Cooking and Kids Baking Championship. Her talent and passion for cooking have earned her accolades, including two Daytime Emmy Awards for Valerie's Home Cooking. In December 2021, Bertinelli signed a new deal with the Food Network, indicating her continued involvement and dedication to culinary programming. Outside of her professional endeavors, Valerie has shared glimpses of her personal life on social media. She rang in the new year in 2023 with a joyful video where she radiated happiness while Taylor Swift's Clean played in the background. She celebrated her 63rd birthday in April 2023, sharing a post to commemorate the occasion with her fans and followers. She's also been open about her journey of healing from past emotional trauma. Through her social media platforms, she's chosen to share this process with her audience, offering support, inspiration, and vulnerability. And of course, one aspect that brings her immense pride is her son Wolfgang. He played alongside Eddie as Van Halen's bassist from 2006 to 2020. Then he embarked on his solo project called Mammoth WVH. As a multi-instrumentalist and vocalist, he released his self-titled debut album in 2021. 
Valerie continues to support Wolfgang's musical endeavors, celebrating his talent and accomplishments as he forges his own legacy in the music industry. Today, Lee Majors is an actor most fondly remembered for his work on the seminal action series The Six Million Dollar Man. At the time the series came onto the air, Lee had already found a modicum of success on TV, but his work on this series rocketed him into the stratosphere. Given how much the show ended up meaning for Lee's career, it may surprise many fans to learn that the actor was initially hesitant to play the part. When Lee expressed his distaste for the concept of The Six Million Dollar Man, his words didn't fall on deaf ears. The concept of the show was tweaked considerably thanks to Lee's creative input. There were a few stipulations that Lee had when it came to joining the cast. For one thing, Lee didn't like how much emphasis was being put on the main character's bionic abilities. At the time Lee was offered the part, the show was going by the working title Cyborg. That lack of humanity wasn't appealing to him. He requested the character be more human, and the show's name was changed to The Six Million Dollar Man. The title and the titular character's lack of humanity weren't the only problems Lee Majors had with the original concept. The show was largely influenced by the 1960s Batman series, which was incredibly campy. Lee was hesitant to join a series with a similarly campy tone, but he was promised that the show would be a good deal more serious than its comic book predecessor. Before the series proper came on air, The Six Million Dollar Man got its start via a pair of made-for-TV features. The second of these included a theme song performed by Dusty Springfield. The Six Million Dollar Man was a huge success. The Dusty Springfield theme song recorded for The Six Million Dollar Man was similar in tone to the opening credit songs being used in James Bond features. This was another aspect of the show that Lee Majors found a little cheesy. Thankfully, after the two made-for-TV features were successful enough to warrant a series, Lee was able to convince those involved to get rid of the cheesy theme song. Another stipulation he had was that he didn't want the show to feature bad guys dying. Instead, he simply beats them up. The Six Million Dollar Man became a major success, and it was obvious Lee deserved a fair amount of the credit. Not only was Lee the perfect actor to portray the titular character, but the creative control he had in regards to the show's concept paid off immensely. Without his creative input, the show arguably wouldn't have struck a chord with audiences in the way it did. Two years into the show's five-season run, Majors came up with another stipulation. He thought it was time to shake things up. His character had yet to have a love interest on the show, and Lee thought this was a shame. An actress named Lindsay Wagner was hired onto the series to play a new romantic interest. Lindsay was hired in 1975. Then, in a special two-part episode, her character was killed off. Her character's death made fans so upset it eventually had to be undone. Her character was brought back to life and given her own spin-off. That was called The Bionic Woman. Though it didn't last as long as The Six Million Dollar Man, it was a minor success, lasting two seasons from 1976 to 78. Why The Six Million Dollar Man Ended The Six Million Dollar Man aired from 1974 to 78, though the first made-for-TV feature based on the concept premiered in 1973. All in all, three made-for-TV features and five seasons of the show were produced. According to Lee Majors, he was surprised when the show was taken off the air. It was still incredibly successful, but the hefty budget made the studio feel as if producing more episodes wasn't feasible. They felt there were more than enough episodes to keep it on the air via syndication. Though Lee Majors wasn't expecting the show to end, he wasn't too upset about it. For five years, working on the series had eaten up the majority of his free time. This was made all the more cumbersome when you consider the fact that Lee had just married his second wife in 1973. During the years he was working on the show, he was also trying to make his new marriage work. The woman that Lee was married to over the course of The Six Million Dollar Man was Farrah Fawcett. When Lee and Farrah married, she wasn't a star in her own right but she was a model. When they got married, the intended arrangement was that Farrah would stay at home and prepare Lee's meals while Lee would continue his career as a TV star. Farrah could do her modeling work in her spare time, and it wouldn't interfere with how much time she got to spend with her husband. Even if Lee had to work long days due to his television commitments, Farrah would still be available when he was done. But not long after the marriage started, Farrah started becoming a major celebrity in her own right. 
In 1976, she was cast to play one of the leads on the hit series, Charlie's Angels. Why Lee Majors and Farrah Fawcett Got Divorced After Charlie's Angels became a big success, the dynamic of their marriage changed considerably. Now the two were barely able to see each other whatsoever. Lee wasn't upset at his wife for her newfound success. Instead, he was simply sad he was hardly able to see her anymore. Farrah felt the same way, but she was also incredibly grateful that she was becoming a star in her own right. When the $6 million man ended, Lee may have envisioned that he was finally going to spend more time with Farrah. But this didn't end up being the case. She was still busy. In fact, by the time of the $6 million man's cancellation, Farrah had grown to eclipse her husband in terms of fame. After Farrah announced that she and Lee Majors were separating, and before the divorce officially went through, the two stars spent a romantic day together in Atlanta, Georgia. The romantic getaway was part reunion, part farewell. But it shows there was truly no bad blood between the two performers once they decided to call it quits on their marriage. They even stayed the night together, which is something the majority of couples would have a hard time with when preparing for a divorce. After divorcing Farrah Fawcett, Lee Majors took a hiatus from the entertainment industry and traveled around the world. He said he was surprised to find out what a major impact his work on The Six Million Dollar Man had on people across the globe. Eventually, he returned to acting. At age 83, Lee still shows up in the media every once in a while. Sadly, Farrah passed away in June 2009. She was 62. Upon Farrah's passing, Lee had plenty of kind words to share about his ex-wife. Lee and Farrah both moved on. Besides Farrah Fawcett, Lee Majors has had three other wives, and Farrah had a couple of other serious relationships during her life. Prior to Farrah, Lee was married to a woman named Kathy Robinson from 1961 to 64. After that, Lee was married to a Playboy model named Karen Velez from 1988 to 94. Today, he's married to a much younger woman named Faith. Faith is over three decades younger than Lee, and the May-December romance turned plenty of heads when they married in 2002. But the fact that they're still married after two decades shows they still love each other. Though Farrah never remarried after divorcing Lee, she did have another serious romantic partner. She became romantically involved with movie star Ryan O'Neill. Aside from a brief separation in the late 90s due to Ryan's infidelity, the two remained together until Farrah's death. Before meeting Lee Majors, Farrah dated a football player named Greg Lott. Dresher and Jacobson's history goes back to when the two were only 15. They met in high school where they started a relationship that blossomed into a marriage just six years later. Dresher and Jacobson's chemistry was undeniable, and given their history, it's no wonder they played the perfect couple on screen. But after almost 20 years of marriage, they separated in 1996 and divorced only a few years later. It turns out, Jacobson struggled to recognize his own homosexuality. During an interview with Oprah, he revealed he had no idea he was gay when they got married. He never cheated on Drescher or even experimented with his sexuality. But this didn't stop him from dealing with inner turmoil, and he chose to begin therapy to get help. Three different therapists told him he was straight and it was natural to have thoughts about being gay. He was convinced that as long as he wasn't acting on these thoughts, there was nothing to be concerned about. But as it turns out, there was something deeper going on. When I walked over to Jacobson said, began his therapy eight, sessions in 1985 uh, after falling victim to a violent break-in. Drescher, Jacobson, and one of their friends were having dinner in their home when two armed robbers forced their way into the house. The robbers assaulted and abused the couple and their friend before stealing valuables and making their escape. Surprisingly, the couple kept this story under wraps for over a decade before it became public knowledge. Between the trauma of the break-in and the struggle with his sexuality, Jacobson was not left in a healthy state of mind. He revealed on Oprah he regressed and ignored his feelings, which left him in a constant state of anger. Drescher quickly noticed this change in her husband. She noticed he had become controlling and insecure, and was even upset when Drescher spent time with their dog instead of him. Interestingly, both Drescher and Jacobson admit that Jacobson's struggles never affected their sex life. Jacobson told Oprah they had great sex, and Drescher agreed, saying he was a very sexual man. When Jacobson couldn't ignore his sexuality any longer, he confided in Drescher, telling her he was bisexual. 
However, for him, their marriage was more important than acknowledging and acting on his sexuality. Drescher said that when Jacobson told this to her, he still wanted to spend their lives together and promised he wouldn't cheat. She didn't know how to address the change. Instead of addressing how his changing sexuality was affecting her, she took his honesty as a testament to how much he loved her. The two gave their relationship more time, committed to making the marriage work. Eventually, though, Drescher decided to end things, which Jacobson didn't take too well. She revealed he begged her to stay, but she felt trapped and suffocated. At a certain point, he had no option but to accept her choice, and he moved to New York to be on his own. Jacobson's departure happened to be on the same day the nanny ended, and the two wouldn't speak for a year. During this time, Drescher was suffering from an undiagnosed disease, and two years of tests were inconclusive in determining the condition. Ultimately, she was diagnosed with uterine cancer. Shortly after, her manager called Jacobson to tell him the tragic news. As revealed on Oprah, this discovery cut Jacobson to the core. He said any anger that he harbored had vanished, and he felt nothing but love, as he feared for Drescher and her life-threatening diagnosis. Fortunately, just a few years later, Drescher beat cancer. She then wrote Cancer Schmancer, retelling her battle with the disease. During a publicity book tour, she made a stop in New York, where she decided to meet up with Jacobson. During this visit, Jacobson revealed to her he was not bisexual, but actually just homosexual. He wanted Drescher to be the first to know, so she wasn't blindsided when the news hit the media. In a later interview, Drescher expressed relief and comfort that Jacobson was finally able to explore his sexuality. After their ups and downs, the two have finally stabilized into a close, healthy friendship. They realize that they each play an integral role in each other's lives, despite the rocky ending to their relationship. After all, they owe a lot of their career success to one another. If you're enjoying this video so far, don't forget to like it and subscribe to Factsverse if you haven't already. And stick around to find out how these two are doing today. In her early years, Drescher was frustrated about how her career was going. She was unhappy with the roles offered to her and felt undervalued. The Nanny was a big hit, not just during its original run, but also reruns. The show's six seasons, which spanned 146 episodes, were well-received among audiences and critics and earned Drescher nominations for two Emmys and two Golden Globes. Before this success, though, the roles offered to her were subpar. In a Fox News interview, she said she was mostly offered roles to portray a kind-hearted hooker. She further added she felt disrespected and refused to play into it, deciding she'd explore other ways of becoming successful. Jacobson played a big role in helping Drescher realize her potential. He bolstered her confidence and assured her she was meant for bigger roles, and supported her in declining projects that didn't acknowledge her talent. Today, Drescher says she's happily single and in an extremely satisfying relationship with herself. In an interview, she even mentioned she shared a friends with benefit arrangement with somebody. More recently, in a closer weekly interview, she added that the pandemic put dating on the back burner and she's enjoying the free time to de-stress and unwind. In the same interview, she said she's happy to be focusing on herself for a change. She practices Buddhism and feels peaceful being by herself. Looking back, Drescher says the divorce was a turning point in her life when she decided to start living for herself and exploring who she really was. Her battle with cancer made her more self-aware, and she now leads the Cancer Schmancer movement, which aims to raise awareness about how to identify early signs of cancer. Early Success and Crawford Courtship Richard Gere's rise to international superstardom in the 1980s set the stage for the unconventional love story that was to come. Having established himself as a handsome leading man and sex symbol in films like American Gigolo and An Officer and a Gentleman, Gere was at the peak of his celebrity in Hollywood. With dozens of high-profile magazine covers, talk show appearances, and box office hits under his belt, the charismatic actor was one of the most famous faces on the planet. It was at the height of this fame and success that in 1988, Gere crossed paths with a model named Cindy Crawford at a party in Beverly Hills. At just 21 years old and fresh off her debut in the prestigious Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, Crawford was newly exploring the exhilarating but intimidating world of international modeling. Among the dazzling array of celebrities in attendance, it was Gear who immediately caught her eye the most. Already dedicated to his movie star craft at 37, he exuded a sophistication, wit, and charm that enthralled the wide-eyed Crawford. 
A fast friendship blossomed between the two that summer, which evolved into a passionate romance. By 1991, Crawford had broken out as arguably the premier supermodel working at the time, appearing on hundreds of magazine covers that spread her girl-next-door beauty across the globe. That same year, she achieved full-fledged icon status when she appeared radiantly on Gear's arm at the Academy Awards in her now legendary sheer red Versace gown. The couple basked in their role as the glamorous pair dominating Hollywood. But behind closed doors, the challenges of their 15-year age difference were already presenting issues. While Gear balanced a thriving film career with his mature interests, Crawford was only just entering her 20s and finding her footing in the modeling industry and life. Ever the spontaneous duo, they made the surprise decision that December to secretly wed in Las Vegas. Their whirlwind celebrity romance had brought them great joy, but the gaps in their lives soon proved difficult for Crawford to navigate in the years ahead as she came into her own. Age Differences and Cracks Form it didn't take long for the difficulties of Cindy Crawford and Richard Gere's relationship to become apparent. Though still very much in the honeymoon phase of their marriage in 1992, cracks were emerging. Crawford was finding her footing in the spotlight, but still discovering herself as a young woman. Meanwhile, at 38, Gere had settled comfortably into his prestigious Hollywood career and interests established over the decades. As Crawford's modeling fame rocketed to stratospheric new heights, the demands of her schedule pulled her further onto the global stage. Long shoots in distant cities kept her traveling constantly, while Gere remained settled at their L.A. home. His interests in philanthropy, politics, and Tibetan Buddhism did not always align with the fast-paced social scene Crawford was immersed in either. And at 22, Crawford was undergoing the transformational period of self-discovery that comes in one's early 20s. By 1994, the inevitable issues of their mismatched life phases had become too great a strain. While on location for shoots around the world, Crawford began to realize how unfulfilled she felt trying to mold herself around another person. She appreciated all that Gear had shown her as a famous partner, but their relationship no longer felt like an empowering partnership. That year, their communication struggles escalated amid the challenges of long-distance living. Friends observed Crawford becoming increasingly distant and unhappy at events despite their smiles for the cameras. After much soul-searching during these tumultuous months, Crawford realized the only way forward was to take control of her personal life course before it passed her by. In late 1995, she filed for divorce from Gear, citing irreconcilable differences stemming from their growing personal disconnect. Though saddened by the end of the marriage, Crawford embraced the opportunity to fully unlock her potential without compromise. Finding Lowell and Family Life Following his divorce from Crawford, Richard Gere took time to reflect deeply on what he wanted from his next relationships. After a few years of traveling the world for philanthropic work and enjoying bachelor freedom again, Gere's interest led him onto the set of the James Bond film The World Is Not Enough in 1999. There, he met actress Carrie Lowell, who was playing the role of Bond Girl. Lowell, a model-turned-actress, was instantly drawn to Gear's intelligence, kindness, and conversation skills. Soon, they began quietly dating. In 2000, their son Homer was born, and the pair quickly fell in love with being parents together. By this point, Gear had turned 50 and found a new sense of peace and joy centering his life around family. He and Lowell married in a private ceremony in 2002. Lowell spoke of admiring Gear's gentle spirit and generous nature, saying he was unlike any man she had met. For several years, they kept a low-profile home in New York, where Gear helped raise Homer while continuing Oscar-nominated roles. All seemed well, but over a decade into their marriage, the same disconnectedness that plagued Gear's first union reemerged. Lowell, an outgoing social butterfly, found herself tiring of Gear's increasingly reclusive tendencies. Reports surfaced of Lowell feeling held back by her husband's demands for extensive privacy, even saying friends jokingly called her the warden. Conversely, Gear was unwilling to alter their lifestyle that brought him fulfillment. By 2016, their core differences had escalated to an irrevocable point. Lowell filed for divorce, citing that their lifestyles were no longer compatible. Though devastated to split the family, they agreed to jointly co-parent Homer with kindness and respect. Lowell has since gone on to enjoy an active, creative life in upstate New York. Reconnecting with Silva 
After two failed marriages, Gear was content to remain single. But then, unexpectedly, Love found him again in the summer of 2014 during a chance reunion with an old friend from his native New York. Alejandra Silva, a dark-haired beauty from Madrid, had grown up knowing Gear's family and attended the same small schools as his siblings decades prior. She had become a prominent public speaker and activist in her home country, founding a nonprofit organization dedicating to assisting the homeless population. Through her compassionate work, she embodied qualities Gear held most dear. Despite their 33-year age gap, Gear and Silva were drawn to each other immediately. Soon relocating to live with Gear in upstate New York, Silva fully supported his philanthropic endeavors while pursuing her own. They made frequent appearances volunteering together for various charitable causes globally. By 2018, Gear and Silva decided to legalize the bond, exchanging vows at a New York City courthouse. They welcomed their first child, a son named Alexander, with pure joy. Then in 2020, they announced the birth of a second son. At 74, Gear had found respite in the stability of his final marriage through a partner deeply understanding his heart and purpose for making the world brighter. Garth Brooks and Sandy Maul Garth Brooks is one of the most successful country music stars of all time, but that didn't make him immune to struggling through a rough and highly publicized divorce. He's been married twice, and his divorce from his first wife, Sandy Maul, was one of the most talked about divorces in the entertainment industry. Brooks and Maul were high school sweethearts and got married in 1986. They have three daughters together, Taylor, August, and Allie. Despite being married for over a decade, the couple faced several issues as their marriage progressed. Brooks's music career was soaring, and he was on the road for most of the year, leaving Maul alone with their children. The long distance took a toll on their relationship, and the couple grew apart. In 1999, Brooks and Maul announced their separation, and their divorce was finalized in December of the same year. The divorce settlement was one of the most expensive in the industry, with Maul receiving a reported $125 million in assets, including a ranch in Oklahoma and a mansion in Nashville. It was a significant blow to Brooks, who was known for his dedication to his family. In several interviews, he's spoken about how the divorce affected him emotionally and how it impacted his music. Brooks took a break from music after the divorce and focused on raising his daughters. He married Trisha Yearwood in 2005 and they've been together ever since. Despite the difficult divorce, Brooks and Maul maintained a friendly relationship for the sake of their kids. In an interview with Good Morning America, Brooks said, quote, We're family. We're forever going to be family and that's cool. It's just that simple. Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt The divorce of Brangelina has been perhaps one of the most talked about splits in Hollywood history. This is no doubt because of the star power each one of them has, as well as the amount of money potentially involved. But it's also made more complicated by the number of children they have, as well as allegations of abuse that were put forwards towards Pitt after an incident on a private plane. Plus, the proceedings have taken so many years, it seems like it'll never be complete. The pair were together for more than 10 years and then married for two, but they filed for divorce in 2016 and have been in a wild legal battle ever since. The two have three biological kids together and another three whom they've adopted. The process has no doubt put a strain on the lives of these children, and media reports have speculated that there's been pressure on them to pick sides between the famous couple. And when the abuse allegations are added in, the kids are likely torn about how to move forward. Pitt has struggled with addiction issues, though is reportedly clean and sober now. If public photos are to be believed, it seems as if both parents have made it a priority to see and help their kids move through childhood, despite not being together as a celebrity couple any longer. Estimates of the value of their assets being sorted through in the divorce range up to $400 million. Tiger Woods and Elon Nordegren as one of the most famous and successful pro golfers of all time, Tiger Woods' personal life was already a focus of tabloids and fans all over the world. And this only increased when, in 2009, several women came forward claiming to have had affairs with him. This scandal led to the eventual dissolution of his marriage to Elon Nordegren. Woods and Nordegren were married in 2004 and had two children together. But when it broke that Woods had been involved in multiple extramarital affairs, it quickly became a major news story and was covered extensively by the media. In the wake of the scandal, Woods took a break from golf and sought treatment for sex addiction. 
Meanwhile, Nordegren filed for divorce in December 2009, citing irreconcilable differences. The divorce was finalized in August of 2010. The terms of the divorce settlement weren't disclosed, but it was reported that Nordegren received a significant amount of money. Some estimates put the settlement at around $100 million. She also reportedly receives monthly child support payments of around $20,000. She also kept their home in Windermere, though she ended up selling that home before too long. Since the divorce, Woods has continued to play golf at a high level, including his recent comeback from a near-fatal car accident. He's also been involved in several high-profile relationships, including with Olympic skier Lindsey Vaughn and restaurant manager Erica Herman. Kevin Costner and Cindy Silva Kevin Costner has been an A-list actor and director for over four decades. He has starred in numerous successful films, including Dances with Wolves, The Bodyguard, and Field of Dreams. And his recent turn as the lead in the hit show Yellowstone has further solidified his star power. But Costner's personal life has not always been smooth sailing. He was married to Cindy Silva, his college sweetheart, for 16 years. The couple met while studying at Cal State University, Fullerton, and got married in 1978. They have three children together, Annie, Lily, and Joe. But in 1994, they announced their separation and the divorce was finalized in 1995. The reasons for the split were not disclosed, but it was reported the couple had been having problems for some time. According to some reports, the divorce cost Costner somewhere in the range of $80 million. He went on to marry his current wife, Christine Baumgartner, in 2004. They have three children together and have been married for almost 20 years. Despite the end of his first marriage, Costner has remained on good terms with Silva. In fact, he even thanked her during his acceptance speech for the Best Director Oscar for Dances with Wolves in 1991. So while his divorce was undoubtedly difficult, he has since moved on and built a successful career and happy family life. Steven Spielberg and Amy Irving Steven Spielberg's epic career as a writer and director has spanned more than five decades, but his personal life has had its ups and downs, including a high-profile divorce from actress Amy Irving. Spielberg and Irving first met in the late 70s and began dating soon after. They got married in 1985 and had a son together, Max. But the marriage was short-lived, and the couple separated just four years later. The divorce proceedings were highly publicized and became a major news story at the time. One of the main points of contention was a prenuptial agreement that the couple had signed before getting married. Irving challenged the validity of the agreement, arguing it was unfair and that she had been coerced into signing it. After a lengthy legal battle, Irving was eventually awarded a settlement of $100 million. This was one of the largest divorce settlements in Hollywood history at the time. Despite the acrimonious divorce, Spielberg and Irving have remained on good terms and have even worked together on several projects. Harrison Ford and Melissa Matheson Perhaps given the cantankerous roles Harrison Ford plays like Han Solo and Indiana Jones, it might not come as too much of a surprise that he would struggle through at least one relationship. In the late 70s, he married screenwriter Melissa Matheson, with whom he had two children. But after more than a decade of marriage, the couple divorced in 2004. The reasons for the divorce weren't made public, but it was reported the couple had been having problems for some time. One of the main issues was said to be Ford's reluctance to commit to the marriage and settle down in one place. Matheson was a successful screenwriter in her own right, best known for writing the screenplay for E.T. She continued to work after the divorce and went on to write several other successful films, including The Black Stallion and Kundun. They remained on good terms until her death in 2015. Ford paid tribute to her in an interview with Entertainment Weekly in 2015, saying she was a remarkable person and a very talented writer. Ford moved on and married actress Callista Flockhart, and the two have been happily married for more than a decade. Now it's time to hear from you. Which of these celebrity divorces did you follow when it was in the news? Let us know in the comments section below.